Good evening, and thank you all for coming to this joint forum with mayoral and city clerk candidates here in Northampton. I appreciate your time to come this evening and learn more about these important races. My name is Ingrid Flory, and I'm representing the League of Women Voters in the Northampton area, and I'll be the moderator this evening. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. We encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government. We work to increase the understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. I'd like to say, thank our sponsors tonight, which include the Daily Hampshire Gazette, the Northampton Area League of Women Voters, Northampton Community Television, WHNP Radio. And I'd like to welcome all of you in attending this evening, um, either here in person or listening from home. WHMP and NCTV are streaming live this evening, so um, please do mute your cell phones so we don't have distractions. Oh, the shuffle. <laughs> um, and I'd like to introduce um, our candidates who are running for mayor. That will be the first portion of our forum this evening. Um, we have uh, David Narkowitz and John Riley with us tonight. So thank you for coming. Our panelists this evening, uh, I, we have um, Jean Churdak, who's from the League of Women Voters, and she will be asking questions on behalf of audience members. Thank you, Jean. We have Stan Moulton, who's the opinion editor for the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Natalia Munoz, who's a uh, host of Via Con Munoz on WHMP Radio. Thank you all for participating this evening. Thank you, Ingrid. So as timekeepers, we have the League of Women Voters. Um, the candidates have drawn straws to decide who's who will be um, answering questions first this evening. We are not doing opening statements. We're going to go right into, um, into our questions so we can get through as many as we can. So, um, so David uh, picked the short straw, so he'll be answering the first question this evening. Questions from panelists will rotate as follows. The League of Women Voters, followed by WHMP. League of Women Voters again, and the Gazette. This is so that the League's questions, um, which are coming from audience members, um, will have two questions in the rotation, and that will allow time for as many audience questions as questions from, um, from our media pa panelists. Questions are limited to 30 seconds in length and must be asked to both candidates. So again, if you are writing down questions in the audience, make sure that they're phrased so that they can be answered by both candidates. Candidates will have 90 seconds to answer the questions. Rebuttals will be allowed if the candidate singles out or criticizes the other candidate by name or implication. The offended candidate may ask for 30 seconds to respond, and one rebuttal time will be allowed per candidate. And at the end, uh, the candidates will be given two minutes to make closing statements. We'll end this portion of the forum at 8 o'clock and segue immediately into our forum for the city clerks. So I hope you'll all stay to learn more about those important positions. So to start, um, Jean Churdak will be posing the first question. And David, you'll be the, get to answer first. OK, thank you. Um, what will you do to ensure that every neighborhood is treated fairly with regard to DPW repairs and projects? How will you make that information available and make sure money is distributed fairly? Thank you very much for the question, and thank you uh, for hosting this forum tonight. So when we put together our capital projects, and particularly our paving projects, uh, we work with our DPW to look at the needs and assessments of all of our streets around the city. Um, we particularly look as well as at infrastructure, including underground infrastructure like water and sewer and stormwater. Um, and then we try to prioritize those uh, roads that are in the need of the most repair. We also look to make sure that we're doing roads in every part of the city. 
So if you've been around the city this summer, for example, you've seen work being done on Day Avenue. You've seen work being done on Ryan Road. Um, you've seen work being done, you know, um, uh, uh, in, in pretty much every ward in the city, including crack sealing that we're doing all around the city as well. So that's really the process. We we try to use data to look at what are the um, what are the most critical roads that need fixing. Um, and then there are some roads, uh, for example, uh, Burt's Pit Road is one that I hear a lot about. We're doing some, uh, we're doing some survey work this winter, and we're going to be redesigning that road. That's a road, however, that's going to be a significant expense, and it's also going to require a lot of drainage work, which is part of our stormwater system. So what's happening oftentimes is we're doing multifaceted design work uh, to make sure that when we build roads, they don't fall apart again. So that's really the process and again we bring forward the list uh, to the city council every year so there's transparency thank you, thank you. I'd also like to thank you for hosting this uh, forum uh, I live in Ward 6 and it does appear to me that outer wards are not getting as much paving and as much care as the rest of the city Birch Pit being a perfect example. That's been going on for years and years that that road is so horrible. And it's a crossroad, very important crossroad for us that live in Ward 6 to get into town. I would like to see more high-tech patching going on in, in town. Uh, I see patching of roads where just gravel or paving is, is thrown in and, and you know, run over. and. There's so many more uh, innovative ways to patch roads, and I'd like to see that implemented. That's something that I'm very keen on. It's doing things that are more innovative. Um, I won't call it high tech, but there are ways to, to patch roads that we could not have to be repaving constantly, and I would, would really like to look into that more. Um, where, where I live, I live on Turkey Hill Road, uh, nothing goes on there. We don't have any sewers or uh, uh, sidewalks. And, um, you know, we're going to charge some of the highest stormwater fees in town. Uh, as mayor, I will definitely be reviewing that. Thank you. Next question will come from Natalia, and John, you will answer it first. Well, since it's for both of you, uh, I would like to know what was the if the, what compelling event occurred that brought up the idea of having surveillance cameras in the first place? Natalia, I, I, I don't know. I, I found it to be totally shocking that this came out of nowhere. There is no crime wave in Northampton. I went to the meeting that our chief of police held at the senior center. Her statistics were that Crime rate is actually going down across the board. I think domestic violence might be the only one that is up a little bit. Can't remember the exact numbers, but across the board, crime is down. I live, I, I work downtown. Uh, I know that crime is not a serious problem. The thing that shocked me even more when I was at this meeting is the reason surveillance cameras were being instituted. The chief said it was for stealing that gangs were coming to Northampton and stealing. They may go to the Big Y, they may go to Walmart, steal lobster tails, uh, diapers or something. They are not coming to downtown Northampton and ransacking the town like Vikings or something. I do not see any reason to have surveillance cameras downtown. I also do not want to see cameras on the police. I would find that to be a trade-off between the two and, and grow trust between the two groups, between the police and the citizens. I think dash, dashboard camps are sufficient. I think it protects the police and the citizens when there's an arrest. I would never, ever install surveillance cameras. So um, uh, the way the process really unfolded, Natalia, was that our chief of police, Jody Casper, um, uh, was doing some research. We have cameras already in the city. We have cameras on our police station. We have them in our schools, and our school buses, in our parking garage. We have them in other parts of the city. Uh, they've been effective in terms of preventing and solving crimes. Uh, chief Casper came to me uh, to say that she was looking at this idea of downtown cameras and that 
other communities in Massachusetts have used them. Other communities around the country have used them, again, uh, to look at uh, trying to mostly solve unsolved crimes. And again, uh, downtown Northampton receives 25% of all of the police calls in the city. It's one of their busiest places. Um, it's where most crime, most uh, accidents occur. So. Um, instead of trying to just move that forward and say, I'm going to submit a budget request, I'm going to put it on the capital plan, I give Chief Casper great credit. We talked about let's have a community meeting to talk about it, which, uh, again, is, I think, a testament to her uh, commitment to community engagement. So she had a meeting uh, that she hosted herself at the, uh, at the senior center. Uh, answered every question with with professionalism and respect, as we as we know that's the way she conducts herself, um, and basically you know heard from residents concerns that they had. Now the city council has moved forward; they've passed a resolution. Uh, uh, legislation is now pending to ban them, um, but that was really the rationale. I think her her reasons were because she wanted to be able to make sure she was providing public safety for our community. Jean, you can ask a question, and David, you'll be the first to answer. Okay. Uh, can you explain the controversy of impervious versus pervious in the stormwater fee ordinance? Does it match our zoning in the city? I, I can answer that question. I even know who gave it to you because I've <laughs> talked about it. Um, so, so the whole issue of, of stormwater is the idea that what, the way that it's measured, the units that we look at, um, is really runoff. It's stormwater runoff. Um, stormwater, the, the regulations that are governing it are really environmental regulations. It's also about flooding and infrastructure. Um, and so the way that after, uh, you know, over a year and a half plus of a task force studying this issue, looking at other ways that we, um, that other communities have implemented stormwater programs, uh, they came up with looking at people's property um, and looking at how much impervious surface uh, they had versus pervious surface. Um, now, I know the former building commissioner who's, who uh, has raised this question about in our zoning, um, certain things that are considered uh, uh, per, uh, open space, basically, in the zoning um, are not part of what's considered impervious or pervious in the stormwater regulations, which again, zoning is for land use, looking at a totally different thing um, versus uh, versus the stormwater regulations. So that's it's kind of a super inside baseball kind of a thing, but it really relates to um, what the DPW looks at when they look at a property, driveway, roofs, uh, walkways, things like that. So I think that's what the question is about. Um, and it's really a distinction between what zoning calls open space versus what the stormwater regulation treats it as. I think the distinction between pervious and impervious, or whatever words you want to use, goes to the heart of how this stormwater fee is so unfair. The DPW does not come to your property and measure how much water runoff you get. They're using out of date, photographs and maps. So many people have come to me and told me the water from my property runs out of Northampton, runs into other towns, washes into my field, goes into my lawn. It does not come into the city of Northampton. When the, when the DPW calls something impervious and pervious, they're dealing with a fantasy. They're dealing with a photograph. It may not even be up to date. You have to go to the DPW and fight to get the actual correct measurements on your property. It's about as happy a thing to do as trying to cancel a premium channel on Comcast. <laughs> <laughs> Try to call them. It's really bad. I've, ha I've tried, and they just tell me that I've got to live with what their measurements are. They don't come out to my house and measure. Thank you. Next question <clears throat> from Stan, and go to John. I'm going to follow up on Natalia's question uh, about surveillance cameras. I'd like to know what one or two things you've learned 
listening to the debate from all sides on the question of more cameras downtown, what have you learned that you didn't know before? And do you think that a ban by the city council is the proper step right now? Thanks, Stan. I think that a, a ban is the correct move. I think further studies may come up with other solutions. I saw in the paper that Amherst has some cameras uh, to handle the drunk students coming out of the bars on certain nights. Uh, but most towns have their cameras, if they do, feeding into the IT department, not to the police. Um, the chief of police cited that uh, East Hampton, Belchertown, Amherst all had cameras. I called, I checked. Uh, East Hampton has a couple of cameras on Nashawanic Pond monitoring the boardwalk. That feeds into the IT department. They want to stop graffiti or somebody burning the boardwalk. They are not monitoring the whole town. I agree that having cameras on the police department or perhaps, uh, or actually at the schools and perhaps at the garage uh, might be a good idea. But I think total surveillance makes absolutely no sense and would discourage business downtown. I have a business downtown. I've talked to a lot of people. I've talked to people who said that they would really not want to come downtown if they know that they're being photographed constantly, whatever they're doing. So I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, the mayor asked his, uh, his business uh, improvement uh, director, John Masterson, to do a study of if this is going to help business. <laughs> Um, I, I didn't actually ask the city council, ask my, my economic director, but that's another story. Um, in terms of what I learned, I mean, I think one of the things I learned, and I, I think I thought I knew it, and, I, and I'm even more sure of it now, is that our, our democracy and our governmental system here in Northampton works really well, because I think this was a classic example. I mean, if you look at those other communities, most of those communities just, just put up cameras. Again, Holyoke, Springfield, East Hampton, uh, Westfield, they just put up cameras. In Northampton, we took a more transparent approach. Our chief went out to the community and said, you know, what are the concerns you have? And I think what we learned, what I, so that's one thing that I think is really important um, about our community. I think you've seen how our democratic process works and you've seen how our different branches of government interact. You've seen our police chief, um, you know, whether you agree with her or not, I don't think anyone can doubt her integrity and just the way that she is completely humble and respectful of, of citizens and what their opinions are. Um, and then the other piece is that, you know, we learned that people don't are, are okay with being surveilled when they're in the parking garage, like every inch of the parking garage is covered. They're okay with being, you know, surveilled in some situations or being on camera, um, but there's a concern about being on camera in our downtown. Um, so I think that was probably something that was not expected, um, just given the fact that in the world we live in, you know, you know, whether we're in airports or bus stations or wherever we are, we're on camera, not to mention the fact that people are walking around taking selfies of themselves. So, um, so I think that, those were, that was the other thing that was, um, was a takeaway from the whole discussion. Ban, yes or no? What's that? Ban. Oh, ban. Yes um, no. I actually don't think it's it's necessary because of the process we have. There's no technology purchase that's going to be made without going forward to the city council. Um, so I, I don't actually think it's necessary. I think that on a case by case, as Mr. Riley said, there may be new technology or new things that come along. So I think the process we have is that there's not going to be a purchase without going through both branches of government. So that's just my uh, my my feeling on it. Um, legal and voters will answer a question, ask a question from the audience, and this will go to David. Uh, what effect, if any, will the casino in Springfield have on Northampton? Well, this is something I've been concerned about, concerned since the law was being considered. Um, obviously, when MGM Casino uh, was first announced, I filed uh, for surrounding community status. We did a study um, that looked at what the impacts might be on Northampton. And so, and what they really found is there's sort of a, a, a limited amount of disposable income sort of in our valley, and that most casinos draw from about a 50-mile uh, radius, 50 to 100-mile radius. 
um, and that it would have uh, it could have impacts on our entertainment, on our retail, on our restaurants, um, drawing away uh, drawing away potential visitors. I recently went back to the Gaming Commission and applied uh, for another form of com community mitigation funding um, and testified before the Gaming Commission, and they've actually given us a grant for it's a hundred thousand um, dollars to basically um, work on trying to mitigate those impacts by do, putting together a marketing plan to basically mar make sure that we market Northampton to new visitors to the MGM casino that are coming to the region, that they know they can come you know, 20, 25 minutes up the road um, and be in this great downtown with live art and live music and restaurants. Um, so I do have concerns about it, um, and I do think that it's something that we have to be proactive about, which is why I've been proactive um, as mayor since this whole uh, casino issue began. I found it really disappointing that our State Senator Stan Rosenberg switched and, and supported casinos. It was really a, a disappointment to me when that happened. I've been against casinos from the beginning. I, I think they're uh, prey on the weakest people. It, it's, known, it's a known fact that 30% of the people that, that go to the casinos have gambling problems. One way we might make money is open a gambling rehab here in Northampton and draw people from Springfield, because it's that bad, it's that predatory. I do uh, agree with the mayor that we do have a threat coming from the casino. Um, I would take the money that we're getting, or take any money that we're getting, to combat the casino, and maybe spend it on people that we really want coming here. Let's attract people from, from Tanglewood, from Mass Mocha, from Jacob's Pillow, those are our people, not a bunch of gamblers. Uh, it is going to take money from Northampton. It, it's, it's true. Our, our restaurants and, and venues will probably suffer from that. And I think maybe putting up billboards in Springfield, advertising Northampton, actually taking you know a real active presence, getting those people up here, because Northampton is a unique place. If they try to copy Northampton inside the casino, and try to pretend like they're Northampton. That would be a disgrace. I hope that casino goes out of business in two to three years. And that's actually my prediction. It won't make it. John, you'll answer first. The median home value in Northampton is $290,000. Rents are extremely high. At the same time, Northampton has courageously been steadfast in being a sanctuary city. It is a, a welcoming to people from all walks of life. But um, and yeah, I know that there's uh, mixed housing going up on Pleasant Street. But you know, uh, studio apartments and one-bedroom apartments solves one problem, one part of a, a big problem, not the whole problem. And uh, the, the Valley CDC also has another. If they mixed housing, something like 50 units are regularly priced, and then 11 units will be if they for people with low incomes. If, if my mother, I'm the daughter of a single mother, if my mother moved us to Northampton, if she tried to, she would not be able to. And I think that is the case for a lot of families that would like to move here because the schools are so exceptional. They're, they're great schools here. But there isn't access for families to either stay or to move into Northampton. How will you influence this situation so that Northampton truly is a welcoming city? It's a very good question. Uh, we all know that Northampton is an aging city. Uh, we don't want it to turn into a retirement community. I see lots of people moving here from other parts of the country for their retirement because they want to be in a city that has something going on, that has a cultural life, that has a downtown life, that has something to do, I mean, museums, libraries, it's just such a great town. To, to, to make this a, a friendly town to, to young families, I think, is, is going to be key of all types, of, of any type. and, and uh, keeping the town affordable 
is keeping Northampton the way it is. We don't want to turn into Longmeadow. We don't want to turn into some rich uh, retirement community, however uh, great we are. I, I would try to do or, or encourage, uh, it's hard for a, a mayor uh, to control market forces in the real estate world. I would try to encourage more building in other parts of town, downtown, not just downtown. I think young families really want to live in places like Florence, where there are other young families, where there are schools, where there are parks. They don't want to live downtown. Downtown is for uh, retired people that, that want to, to walk to the museums, want to walk to the bookstores. I think Florence uh, could use some more housing for young families, retired, and, uh, and other people. Uh, it's definitely one of the things that I think about pretty much every day in my job in terms of this whole issue of, you know, well, first of all, I'm proud that we're a welcoming city. I'm you know, proud to have issued the executive order back in 2014. I'm proud to have stood up to the current administration on a number of different issues. Proud to have you know, been a city that welcomed refugees. Um, but you're right. It is, we, you know, we, we, cities can become victims of their own success. People want to live here. They, it's popular. I mean, we have invested significantly significantly into uh, creating uh, affordable housing units. I'm really proud of the work we're doing on Pleasant Street, uh, where we've not only you know in invested city dollars to try to create more affordable units, we're also investing, uh, leveraging dollars to try to improve the neighborhood, to make it a more walkable, livable neighborhood for families so they can live there and shop there and go to school there. Um, we're doing a lot of work in Florence as well. We you know just did some, did some work out um, near Glendale Road to cr working with Habitat to create some affordable homes, first-time home buyers. Um, and, and then also making sure, looking at, you know, we just did a review of our water and sewer fees a few years ago, really with an eye toward making sure that people, that our rates had affordability built in to them, that there was affordability for seniors. Um, we've also tried to increase abatements um, where, where the law allows us to. Uh, when I got elected, I implemented the Senior and Veteran Tax Workout Program as a way for people to volunteer um, to be able to receive an abatement. So we're always trying to find ways um, to create affordable options for people, but it's a challenge, and it's uh, one of the things you know we're going to have to continue to work on every day, and it's something I'm committed to if I'm reelected. Thank you. Thank you. A question from the audience for the League of Women Voters, and David, you'll answer first. Okay, um, I'll take this a step further. What's your position on sanctuary cities, and should Northampton take further steps to protect undocumented immigrants? Uh, well, I think my, my position on it is pretty clear. I, I, in 2014, I issued the administrative policy order effectively you know, directing our police department that they would not, um, they would not you know, voluntarily uh, work with federal immigration, basically not do the job of the federal government, which is really our, in our Constitution. Uh, you know, the, the, the 10th Amendment says that the federal government cannot commandeer local um, city, you know, state and police agencies to do their work. Um, and it's also really uh, a concern about breaking trust with our immigrant communities. And, you know, we, I actually met, me and the former chief met with a, a large group of immigrants in our community who had real concerns about not feeling like they could come forward to the police, not feeling like they could report crimes because they were afraid, you know, they see places in Arizona where people are stopping and asking you for your papers. We don't want to have that type, we, we want to have trust between our police department and all of our residents. So that's why that, pol that's the reason why that policy is so impo important. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, standing up for refugees, uh, 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 standing up against uh, travel bans, which are basically based on people's religion. Um, DACA is a big issue right now. Um, I've been joining mayors around the country to stand up to the president's uh, attempt to overturn DACA. We have tons of dreamers who live in our city, who go to our colleges. These are people who played by the rules. They were they were told, you know, they were brought here as children, and they were told just register with us, and we'll be and you'll be fine, and we'll figure out a path to citizenship, and now you know they're being threatened to be basically thrown under the bus. So we have to continue to stand up to that as well. I'm, I'm very proud that Northampton is a sanctuary city. I think one thing that we really have to keep in mind is how we became a sanctuary city. It's because of war. 
It's because our country is at nonstop war. Both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, have pursued a war policy, 13 wars in 30 years. That's why we're a sanctuary city. We have to take more of a stance against the wars that are going on, and we have to do it whether we're Democrat or Republican, because it doesn't stop whoever gets elected, it stays the same. As I said, I'm very proud that we are a sanctuary city, that we do take these people in. I'm proud that the Supreme Judicial Court is backing us up. It would be really hard to just be out there on your own trying to uh, be a sanctuary city. Massachusetts has taken a very strong stand and supports Northampton. I find ICE to be one of the more virulent uh, entities in the government, and they're getting worse. Uh, they're going after anybody and, and, and everybody. It's, it's not criminals that they're going after. It's not, uh, it's not anybody that's dangerous to us that they're going after. They're going after the easiest to pick, the weakest, and that is what galls me the most. Thank you. Stan. Any questions starting with John? Uh, what role do you see uh, the recreational marijuana industry having in Northampton's economy? Well, it's been held up a little bit by, uh, by, the, the, by, the, by the state legislature. Uh, I am seeing uh, quite a movement in that direction. Stores downtown are already renting space anticipating uh, that they will be able to sell marijuana. Something like shop therapy is already renting the spot next to them, waiting for that to uh, to happen. Um, I'm glad that it's finally happening. People should not be criminalized for smoking marijuana. Uh, marijuana is, is in some ways a wonder drug. Uh, some of the stuff that's coming out of Colorado is, is amazing. <laughs> Uh, opioid use is down in, in Colorado. I, I haven't been there, so I, I'm not talking from you know any experience. Uh, but uh, opioid use has gone down six to seven percent in Colorado because of legalized marijuana. People can get the pain relief that they're looking for. Um, I think that that's probably the brightest light is that people that that need need this drug will be able to get it as far as recreational use uh we should be able to make some more money off of it uh there should be the proper amount of taxes and uh, and revenue coming out of this it could be a boon uh to us i know colorado is making a lot of money off of it so uh certainly you know we were the uh, second dispensary medical marijuana dispensary in massachusetts to open uh, new england treatment access netta which is on con street uh, worked with them they went through our all of our permitting process there have been literally no problems it's been most people couldn't tell you where the where the dispensary was they've been really good corporate citizens they've donated to projects they're donating to bike share um, and I've really had it and I've had a chance to meet with patients who it's really been life-changing um, particularly veterans at our VA hospital um, who suffer from PTSD and, and severe brain injuries where the efficacy of marijuana has been really really powerful um, in terms of the recreational, uh, John uh, mentioned um, the legislature de delayed the implementation of the law. They just recently um, uh, just recently appointed the commission. They're trying to hire an executive director. Really, nothing can happen until um, they put the regulations in place. But there are already people making contacts uh, with us. I do think that again, Northampton voted overwhelmingly. We've had no problems with the uh, with the medical. Uh, my my uh, the plan would be you know probably in the new year to begin looking at our zoning to adjust it to include uh, recreational as well as medical. Um, and I and you know the the law does allow for host agreements. Um, we have a host agreement with Netta that provides some ongoing revenue, a portion of their revenue. Um, plus, we would be able to levy a three uh, percent local option tax, which I would uh, certainly support. Um, again, it's a new revenue source. It's something I'm always talking about. We need to find new revenue sources. And so I think if it's managed well, I think it can be, um, it can be uh, another potential revenue source for Northampton. Thank you. A question from the audience, please. 
To David first. Um, how do you think the new bike share program will affect the city? I think it's going to be great. Um, I had an opportunity to actually ride uh, one of the prototype bikes that was selected. I think this is a great example of Northampton leading in the region. Um, we are part of a consortium of Northampton, Amherst, South Hadley, Holyoke, and Springfield. Um, because we're not huge metropolitan areas like Boston and you know San Francisco, um, it's the, the economy of scale worked better for us to combine forces um, and be able to develop the program uh, together. Um, and so we, um, we, we are the lead community on that. We've received some federal grants for it. We've selected a vendor. Um, and, uh, and we've actually, you know, I mentioned we have corporate sponsors here in the city, uh, Florence Bank and uh, Netta, um, Cooley Dickinson Hospital um, have stepped forward to sponsor it. I think it really fits in well with Northampton's commitment to sustainability and trying to encourage uh, uh, alternative forms of transportation. We've got our great rail trail system and uh, all the other bike accommodations we've been building. Um, and I'm especially interested because we're using a special kind of electric assist bike. Um, it's not an electric bike, but it's an assist bike. And, there, and we're really seeing research that though that technology is going to encourage people who might not otherwise cycle to use a bike, which I think is really the audience we're trying to go after. So I think on an environmental level, reducing climate change, you know, getting rid of uh, more cars on the road congestion on a public health level um, and then really just I think Northampton's a beautiful city to see by bike so it's it's an ecotourism opportunity as well I, th I think it's uh, ecotourism is, is a great uh, concept as far as the uh, the bike share program goes um, Northampton is a beautiful place to see to we could set up trails throughout Northampton where you could go see Calvin Coolidge's house or where Sylvia Plath went to school uh, really encourage more tourism in in Northampton I think uh, most people here in town if you are a biker you're going to have your own bike uh, but I do think people coming from out of town would love that opportunity uh, we do have great bike trails uh, it's a great way to get around um, uh, encouraging more tourism is is really what I think it would be most useful for and, and setting up trails is, is a good idea. What we really want to do is draw more people to Northampton. What keeps, what is the lifeblood, what's become and, and probably always has been is drawing tourists to Northampton. Uh, international tourists are really kind of a lifeblood for Northampton too and nobody loves riding bikes more than Dutch, English, German, French people. If they came and saw that, that would be a really great draw. It would be an, another reason to visit Northampton. Thank you. Next question from Natalia. John first. Uh, I think that we we all agree that the, the plight of veterans is they, they face a, a higher suicide rate, a, a higher homelessness. They have the, a lot of mental health issues. Um, what successes can you point to the city, the city's veterans offices, the city's veterans office? What are the successes that you can point to that it has achieved, and or what more needs to be done to help veterans? I guess it's my turn. Um, I think we have a great VA hospital. Um, it, it really is exemplary. I, I don't know a lot of other uh, VA hospitals, but the horror stories that I've heard don't happen here. We, ha we have one of the best facilities I in the country, and uh, it really serves our citizens very well. The city does have uh, uh, an item in its budget for, for veterans. I, I really, really appreciate that, and I, I think it's very useful. Uh, I would like to see maybe more uh, outreach to all people um, the city having more of a, of a health interest in, in all people that, that are here. Um, I think our VA hospital is doing a great job. Um, there's so many health issues that are coming up that uh, the city has to address. Something like Lyme disease is like a plague. Uh, it, it, it's spreading. It's, it's something that is affecting everybody in Northampton, if not in the in the whole country, as mayor, I would address health issues a little more directly, and pay attention to to our veterans, 
as much as possible, but I would also do outreach more to our own citizens, including veterans, for problems like Lyme disease or other health problems that are growing. Um, I'm extremely proud of our of our work in veterans issues in Northampton. Uh, uh, we Northampton actually provides more services to veterans per capita than any other city in in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, we lead a regional uh, veterans agency. Uh, Steve Connor, our veterans agents, we serve 11 towns. Again, trying to use regionalization to deliver services more effectively. Um, I'm a veteran myself, and I think I'm the only veteran serving an elected government in Northampton right now. So it's an issue that I care about very deeply. Um, I'm also concerned about homelessness and about uh, and about the issue of mental health issues. Um, we work very closely with uh, with the VA, but also with Soldier On, which is a, a great organization in our city, which helps uh, provide um, transition veterans from from homelessness to home ownership. Um, I was one of only a few mayors in Massachusetts to uh, sign uh, uh, First Lady Michelle Obama's uh, pledge to end homelessness in our city, and we've put in place the frameworks. It's not so much that you're going to end it, but that you've put in place the frameworks so that we have coordination between all of our social service agencies um, so we create that safety net um, and you know I've, I've done um, I've done uh, meetings with realtors trying to reach out to realtors um, to try to make sure that they provide housing for uh, veterans we have a VASH voucher program which is a sort of a section 8 program specifically for veterans that we really try to promote um, and then we do a lot of mental health training for our for our police especially so they can be sensitive to the many veterans Veterans who live in Northampton because of the VA hospital. Thank you. Thank you. A question from our audience directed at David first. Are you in favor of a rotary at the Coolidge Bridge? Well, first of all, um, it's uh, I'm in favor of a roundabout. Um, people call them rotaries, but they're actually roundabouts, roundabouts. modern roundabouts. Um, we uh, so uh, some of you may remember a few years ago, the state came in and and had a plan uh, uh, to build to try to fix the problems at Exit 19. Uh, it was a bit of a sort of, uh, you know, trying to kill a fly with a bazooka. It was like they were going to build four-way, uh, you know, uh, flyover exchanges, and it was going to be this huge uh, arterial exchange. Um, luckily, we worked with um, neighborhood groups in Ward 3, um, homeowners of Butters. Um, we actually, I think the Ward 3 folks actually pointed out some of the problems in their studies, that their studies weren't even accurate. Um, and, and thankfully, they've now scaled it back, and they have a plan to try to deal with that really congested intersection, Exit 19, Route 9, uh, Damon Road, and Bridge Street with a modern roundabout, which um, I've been a fan of for many years. I remember distinctly um, standing in a very hostile room at the Look Park Garden House defending the roundabout um, that everyone said would not work and uh, you know couldn't be plowed and people would die. Um, but I think we've seen that they have worked, and the new one is working great um, at Cons and Pleasant Street. Um, and so I think it's a great solution again uh, they are safer uh, they use uh, less less idling cars which means less contribution to car you know carbon pollution and and climate change um, just in every regard I think they're superior and so I'm glad that the state is finally going to move forward with it I think it sounds like a nightmare um, I remember visiting Syracuse New York where they have a uh, roundabout it's like being on the Indianapolis 500. You get in there, you don't know if you're going to make it to the other side. I do not think that a high traffic area, that high of a traffic area, is appropriate for a roundabout. I think the one at Look Park is great. I think the one on the end of uh, Pleasant Street is, is, is very good. They do not come close to the amount of traffic at the Coolidge Bridge. I think that we could do more with computerized lights and monitoring that intersection to to keep traffic moving a, a little bit better um, but a roundabout there I, I'm, I swear that would be like an, an Indy 500 uh, every day would be uh, and it would get worse because traffic keeps getting worse there and it's not going to get better as they build more stores in Hadley as more people commute 
it's going to continue to get worse and that is not a solution a roundabout is not a solution the flyovers the uh, la looking overpasses and all the rest are equally horrible we've got to find something in between but i don't think it's a simple solution to put a roundabout there i, I think it could be just a horrible experience all right Stan, a question from you and john you'll be the first to respond uh, I, I want to return to the issue of homelessness, broaden it beyond simply veterans, <clears throat> because it does affect many people across all segments of our community. The seasonal shelter will open next week, and it's always full. What specifically will you do in 2018 to address the root causes of homelessness? It is a nationwide problem. Northampton is not unique. I've heard people say uh, Northampton has this street problem, the homeless problem, because we're so liberal that we'll take anybody in and we're such kind people. Every town in America has this problem because there's nowhere to live. There are not jobs to, to keep people uh, making enough money to get into an apartment. To get into an apartment is going to cost you about $5,000 between first and last month's rent and deposits and, and all the rest. That's a lot of money to a lot of people, and it's a big impediment to people getting off the streets. Um, I think the homeless shelter does a great job. I think our library does a very good job of, of helping the homeless uh, feel welcome. It's one of the last democratic institutions left is the, is the library. I've noticed a lot of libraries uh, nationwide that are dealing directly with the homeless helping them uh, with maybe mental illness, finding uh, uh, the care that they need, finding the economic opportunities that they might have. It's, it sounds strange, but libraries have become one of the first stops and first aid in dealing with the homeless. I think our library is, is doing a good job. I think they would be willing to do more in helping these people network to find jobs and, and housing. I would work to do that. Again, the issue of homelessness is something that, you know, has been a, a big part of our work in the city and our commitment to, uh, to, to trying to make sure that we provide social services to people. I have a staffer on my staff, uh, Peg Keller. That's what she does. She focuses on that. Um, she leads a, a, a group that meets on a regular basis. Again, people from the various shelters, uh, uh, people that are out actually going out into the streets and into the camps um, to, to meet and try to provide services. We have the same system in terms of our veterans I think it's a um, I think it's a, a really a problem we have to look at this is a great example of something we look at as a region and we actually have a, a great it's called the regional network to end how, uh, homelessness in Western Massachusetts that's been doing some really unique stuff and some creative things particularly in trying to um, get people placed into jobs and get them you know, basically we know that if you get people secure housing and a job that's really the pathway um, you know and then and then obviously the the whole issue of addiction I, I was at the anniversary today of the Northampton Recovery Center and had a long conversation with a man who was homeless he was clean he was happy that he was clean um, but there's sort of this um, catch-22 of him then not finding himself homeless um, not being able to find a dry shelter um, that he could get into um, and so we really have to, to focus on some of those systemic issues about, and also resources, let's not kid ourselves. If our state and federal government won't give us the resources uh, it's to, to take to provide that type of housing, uh, that's going to be a challenge as well. But we continue to work at it, and I'm proud to work on it. Thank you. A question from the audience via Jean. Uh, where do you stand on expanding pilot programs in Northampton? payment in lieu of taxes, P-I-L-O-T programs. Well, uh, I, uh, as I think as I said in the paper at the time, I'm the guy that charged up the hill on that issue. Um, it's something that we were, um, that had been talked about for a, a long time, the whole issue of payment in lieu of taxes. Um, and so a couple of years ago, I um, created a program where we, where essentially we came up with a formula very similar to the Boston pilot um, program that's been highly successful to really talk to our um, largest non 
uh, tax-exempt property owners. Interestingly, um, when you look at a list of cities in Massachusetts, um, in terms of the percentage of uh, tax-exempt property, Northampton is like in the top five in terms of cities and percentage. I mean, it's great that we have these great institutions. We're a center, um, it being the county seat that we have, you know, Cooley Dickinson, that we have Smith College. Um, but they also uh, use our services, our public works, our public safety. Um, and so I thought it was a really important conversation to have. Often when we have tough fiscal times in the city, people say, well, why aren't you asking Smith College for money? Why aren't you asking these other institutions? who don't pay taxes. Um, so I thought it was incumbent to have that conversation, not in a crisis, but but to do it in a really thoughtful way. Um, you know, Smith College made a pledge of $300,000. Uh, 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 Cooley Dickinson made a pledge of uh, $30,000. And we continue to have those conversations about, um, again, we, it's great that we have those institutions, um, but they do use our services. And so there's got to be a way to figure out um, uh, ways that they can contribute toward those services. So that's why I think it's an important issue. Thank you. Well, the pilot program is not as successful as it was touted it was going to be. Uh, the nonprofits feel that they're already doing social work, doing quality work for the city. I would work to get Smith and Cooley Dickinson and some of these places to, to do more with in-kind uh, contributions they may not be all that willing to cut loose of their cash but getting Smith to participate more in uh, our arts and cultural activities in town by maybe opening studios or uh, bonding more with the city and not just being in their own little world uh, we educate their their students uh, when they come to downtown Northampton. I would expect Smith to to do more for Northampton. I know my kids went to a uh, summer school uh, at Smith College that was just great. It was one of the best summer schools I've ever seen. I would look for more in-kind contributions. Maybe work with Cooley Dickinson to do more for uh, drug rehabilitation. We need a, a drug rehab here in, in Northampton. Uh, Always asking for money uh, isn't necessarily the best way to go. Uh, and if we are going to ask for money, we have to prove what they're going to get for it. It would take a real salesman to go in there and convince them to give this, give us the money, not just begging. Thank you, Natalia. This is a John. Okay. Geographically specific, Damon Road, uh, from Bridge, uh, from Bridge Road to Damon Road. As you know, was it about a year ago, two years ago, that the traffic pattern was changed? There were a couple of traffic lights put in, installed at the end of the industrial park. Before, the traffic used to go all the way from Route 9 to King Street. Now the traffic is all the way backed up on Bridge Road to Route 9. Am I drawing the, the map yes. in a way that... That's understandable. What are the plans that need to be in place to alleviate that? Because basically, the only thing that changed was instead of being on traffic on one end, now you're on tr in traffic on the other end. If we don't do something about that, it's going to make it uh, very difficult for people to, to want to commute. I, I go to Amherst and, and Hadley very frequently, and it's very trying. It's very difficult uh, on the nerves, and uh, it's it's only getting worse. And then to come back to Northampton and face that uh, intersection that you're talking about is is chaos. I'm very keen on getting our lights to function when there is traffic and not have red lights going on when there are no cars there. My my pet peeve is is one on King Street. Not the one near the fire station, the one near the uh, near the Firestone, uh, that will go off as you're driving down King Street, and there are no cars that want to come onto King Street. Why is that light coming on? I think we should do a study of all of the lights in town and have lights that function only when they need to, not just going on and off and 
and stopping people and uh, for, for no good reason. But the place that you're talking about is very important, and I think it's important to keep the trucks moving through there rather than through the neighborhoods. Uh, they have to learn that that's the way to go, and I see them using it more. Um, that's a big problem is, is the trucks going through there, but it's, it's a necessity. But I think getting the lights to work uh, more when there is traffic and not when there isn't and, and getting things to flow. If you have a long line of traffic, have it a green light for as long as you need to get those people through. They used to do it with traffic cops, but, you know, maybe we need some, uh, some high-tech traffic cops. So um, uh, the issue on Damon Road, first of all, those lights on Damon Road and that, that intersection, the layout belongs to the state. It's the Commonwealth's lights and their layout. Um, one of the issues that caused, I think, what you're talking about is um, when the rail, when the Amtrak trains came back to Northampton, which we were all very happy about, they needed to do a short-term fix uh, for safety uh, because of the crossing gates. They needed to keep traffic. I don't know if you remember the old days, you'd be sitting at the light there and you'd just be sitting on the railroad tracks because trains never came by. Well, now there's trains coming by at you know 60 miles an hour, so we can't have that anymore. So, uh, so they put the light in um, at Industrial Drive to try to create a better queue. Then that caused all kinds of problems. Then the Ma then Mass DOT came back and did some lane adjustments um, to try to create more room for cars to queue. The real solution is there is a plan, and it's actually in the um, transportation improvement program for the region that the state is going to fund to do a complete renovation of Damon Road, um, including adding sidewalks, including adding bike lanes, including um, making sure there's adequate lane width um, to so that we can. Can control that really major artery and we've been I've been talking to Mass DOT about it if you think about it it's really the north-south connector to their north and south um, exits so it really serves a, a dual regional purpose so um, we're actually working that with them right now to begin the right-of-way work um, uh, because we basically have to go out and get all the permissions to do the right-of-way but that's really the long-term fix that's going to make that um, state light at uh, Damon and King function better the way it's supposed to once we finish the renovation of Damon Road. Okay. Thank you. A question from our audience, please. Uh, what is the opinion, what is your opinion of the Community Preservation Act? To you first, David. Uh, my, um, well, I have been a big supporter of the Community Preservation Act. I supported it uh, actually back in 2005 um, when the community w was first campaigning for it. Um, again, it focuses on um, setting aside a special revenue source for open space, for affordable housing, for, for historic preservation. Um, and I think uh, the results you see all around Northampton, um, we've been able to really work on a host of projects, everything from you know work at uh, Forbes Library, um, work at preserving open space, um, you know the Pulaski Park renovation that we were able to accomplish over the last three years was largely funded with Community Preservation Act dollars. Um, and we've done a lot of work uh, in affordable housing. The, the, the two uh, developments that we discussed on Pleasant Street um, receive community uh, preservation dollars. So to me, um, it really has been the essence of how you preserve your community. And there's these, these, these uh, projects that we couldn't otherwise be able to fund as part of our budget. I think we have a great community preservation committee that really works diligently and, and puts applicants through a really rigorous process um, and make really great recommendations to the council and ultimately to the mayor. Um, but I'm a big supporter of it. It was actually renewed overwhelmingly uh, five years later. Um, my one concern is that I think the state, because it's become so successful and because now Boston has adopted it, so many people have adopted it, I think the state has to go back and look at the funding mechanism uh, to make sure that the matching funds uh, keep pace with all the communities that are now um, opting in. I'm a big supporter of the CPA as well. <coughs> I do see it as a fund that could be abused uh, fairly easily, borrowed against, uh, as with Pulaski Park. Um, I don't know how many millions of dollars we spent redoing Pulaski Park, um, cutting down a few trees, uh, turning it into a glorious uh, bus stop. Uh, but. And now we're spending CPA dollars on building sidewalks down on Pleasant Street for a, a private corporation. Uh, I would really keep an eye on that CPA money and, and not borrow against it so that 
it, it can't be used. Uh, I don't know how many years we still have to keep borrowing on that CPA to pay for Pulaski Park. I do like uh, the idea of buying open land and preserving it. I think Northampton needs to do that, looking towards the future. Um, that is where I would like to see the money spent, and also on historic preservation. Thank you. A question from Stan that will be directed first at John. Uh, was it worth spending nearly $50,000 and countless hours on a legal dispute to establish that Forbes Library is, in fact, a, uh, in, uh, independent from uh, municipal uh, control and uh, affirming what the position of the Forbes Library trustees has been for, for many years? No. Uh, it's simply put, um, I think when the current mayor asked his solicitor to call the Forbes Library a city department in his letter to the library. That was a huge mistake. It's not a city department. We all know that. We support its independence. We consider the Forbes Library to be the crown jewel of Northampton. To call it a city department would be to, to demean it completely. Fifty thousand uh, dollars, twenty about twenty thousand of city money, thirty thousand of, of Forbes Library money, would have bought what ten thousand books. Um, it was money that was wasted. Um, I understand that uh, the, the library has specific needs, unique needs in terms of maintenance. I think that that could have been worked out in an agreement without calling in the lawyers. I am happy that uh, this has been settled now and that Forbes can move ahead. They're doing a lot of great things up there, expanding um, the, the archives that are, that are very, very rich. And I'm glad that Forbes uh, can do what it wants without city, the city uh, overriding it and, and treating it like a, a water or a sewer department. So um, in terms of Forbes Library, uh, first of all, I'm a huge supporter of Forbes Library. My administration has actually provided more funding to Forbes Library, both in general as well as capital funds than and probably any other uh, administration in history. I've generously supported it. But there's been this historic issue between uh, the city and the uh, library. And it's really just about confusion around, uh, you know, a will that was drafted, you know, 100 plus years ago and how a library that was set up then functions in modern city government. Um, and the fact is that the you know 95% of the funds that fund Forbes Library are tax dollars. So what I was seeking from Forbes Library was more transparency, more accountability, needing to know, and then also most importantly, making sure we were following procurement laws, making sure we were paying prevailing wage, uh, making sure we were following other the other open government laws. And so you know we were having a, actually a great conversation over many years about it. Um, the solicitor's memo actually did not say that they're a city department. Department. He said that when it comes to the budget process and it comes to uh, repairs, because that's the other thing, in the will, the city is responsible for funding all the repairs to Forbes Library. So think about this. We provide 95% of the money and we're responsible for all the repairs. And it also says if it burns down, we have to rebuild it. So that's so the city has an obligation. And as mayor, I have an obligation to the taxpayers to make sure that we're spending the money wisely and that there's transparency. So I wanted an operating agreement. Uh, and, you know, the trustees sued. Um, and at the end of the day, we got an operating agreement, which is really what I wanted from the start. And I think it really, for the first time, clearly delineates the role of the city versus the role have the of, the, um, you. In, you. of the trustees. The, uh, the moment uh, when it's supposed to stop. I mean, going on for 15, 20 seconds beyond that is, is not working out. Okay, so noted. So if you're in the middle of a sentence and this, we come to a stop, I'd like you to... Will do. Quickly finish the sentence so that we can hear the completion of the thought. All right. Question from the audience, please. Jean, this will be directed first at David. Um, where is the money that is sent to the city for the heroin problem in Northampton used? How does it directly impact the addicts in Northampton? 
So how was the money used that's sent to us? So um, so back in 2014, uh, the city took the lead in terms of trying to address the the um, heroin epidemic that's, that's really affecting not only our city, but the region and the state. Uh, we applied to the state um, for a grant that helped us set up the Hampshire Hope Coalition, which is actually run out of our <clears throat> Um, health department, um, and basically it works with uh, agencies all throughout the county uh, on on issues of you know prevention, uh, treatment, um, and and then also training for in some cases our police officers. Um, and this has been a proven model that's been working in other places. The Franklin uh, County Opioid Task Force is one of the models. It's really a way to say we can't. This isn't a law enforcement problem to begin with. This is really a public health issue, and we need to treat it like a public health issue, and we need to marshal all kinds of resources. I was extremely proud about uh, a month or so ago, um, the city, uh, our health department, uh, was one of only about 13 uh, recipients nationwide to receive a federal grant. There are actually no other cities that received one, 1.7 million over the next five years to expand the work of the Hampshire Hope to all of Hampshire County, to provide Narcan to all police departments in Hampshire County. Um, and really, I think it's an affirmation of the model that we created through Hampshire Hope. Again, I was just at the Northampton Recovery Center today, uh, which is a, a peer-led recovery program um, that we're trying to support and that the Hampshire Hope Coalition is trying to support, and we've got funding to do that. So, so that's where the funding is going. Thank you. John? I was very happy to see uh, Hampshire Hope receive its grant uh, to provide Narcan to those suffering from heroin overdoses. A lot of that is, uh, you know, catching the horse after it's gotten out of the barn. Um, I think education, again, is, is, is very key. Uh, also of the parents uh, of children that, that uh, are, are suffering from, from addiction and others, family members uh, should, be, should be taught more about it. Um, I would like to see money coming out of civil asset forfeiture that's going to undercover work by the police or other work with the DA. They, they split that money. I would like to see some of that money going into rehabilitation. Uh, I think that that's key that uh, we, we help these people come back from, from this, this situation. Narcan uh, couldn't be used 20, 30 times to, to help somebody. Uh, the only thing that's really going to work is, is rehabilitation, and I think getting the money for that is, is going to be key, and we have to be very aggressive uh, on that front. Uh, heroin is, is a very unique uh, drug. It's, it's an escape from mental illness, an escape from poverty, escape from emotional problems. Mental health is, is a key part of dealing with opioid addiction. Thank you. Natalia, question from you, and Johnny can answer first. I, this is about transportation. The PBTA uh, is dealing with a, a tightening budget. They want, a, they're removing bus routes. Now, as mayor, how do you handle the situation so that people who don't live in downtown Northampton can still access downtown Northampton, can still get to the hospital, get to see their doctors, and participate in cultural life. I, I think an active bus system is, is key to our future. Uh, we don't have trolleys, we don't have trains, we don't have subways. Uh, we have to have a, a very functional uh, bus service. Unfortunately, uh, the PVTA did not inform the state of its budget problems of being down by almost a million dollars. Our current mayor serves on the, uh, the committee that oversees the PVTA. Um, so a, a million dollar deficit, uh, the state complained that, that they didn't know about it. Uh, we might have been able to do something a little bit earlier if they did. Again, I think innovation is a way to deal with, with buses. Uh, do we need smaller buses to deal with some other uh, situations? Uh, do we need to be running big, heavy buses on, on all of the routes? Again, it could be a high-tech solution of 
finding out where the writers are, who they are, it's something that Uber did, they, they figured it out. Um, we need to do something on that level to actually reach the people that need it instead of just having a general bus running. Uh, UMass uh, had a hackathon a, a few years ago where students all got together and, and brainstormed on, on what they could do to, to make the buses uh, more useful to the students, uh, notifying them of when the bus was coming, letting them know in advance how long it would take. Um, I think high tech and innovation will, will go a long way in solving that. I do serve on the PVTA advisory board. I'm the chair of the PVTA advisory board. Um, and what s essentially happened this year uh, was, uh, was that the funding for PVTA by state government was uh, initially, well, first of all, it's been level funded for the last two years. So we know that when you have a service that expenses are going up, the cost of gasoline is going up, the cost of uh, labor is going up. Um, if you level fund it, uh, you cannot expect to have the same level of service. So uh, for state, for you know, our governor, uh, to, and then specifically in this year, the House uh, uh, proposed to level fund it. The Senate proposed a $1 million increase. Um, and then the governor vetoed that. They conferenced and they ended up giving PBTA an even lower number than either of the first two budget marks. So part of it is a function of what state government's commitment to transit? We have a go we have a governor who claims that he's all for climate change, but then he underfunds public transit, um, and it also has a real impact on working people, and it has a disproportionate impact on people who are poor who rely on transit. So, you know, we uh, we lobbied hard to try to get that funding uh, back in the budget. Um, this is this was not a shouldn't have been a surprise, particularly since it's the state passing the budget, um, and so uh, unfortunately. Unfortunately, the routes had to be cut in order to maintain a level funded budget. Um, we are going out and working with some of our partners, particularly in the five colleges, um, to see about renewing agreements with them that could help provide more funding. Thank you. All right, and a question from our audience, from Jean. This will be directed at David first. Okay. Uh, what, would, what would you want someone new to the community to know about your candidacy and the issues you hope to address? I think that I would want them to know that um, I care deeply about the city. I work very hard. I try to be very active in the community. I try to be out in the community. And I also try to commit myself to making sure that our city government is very open, inclusive, transparent. We want people to get involved in city government and be involved in city government. When we make decisions, um, you know, whether it's things like Pulaski Park, whether it's the, the police camera issue that we just talked about, uh, we really strive to have an inclusive process and an open process where we hear from people. Um, and most importantly, we want them to know that they should feel safe and welcome, um, you know, no matter what their, their gender, no matter what their sexual preference or, or orientation, no matter whether they're an immigrant, no matter their documentation status, whatever that is, um, that they should feel welcome and safe here um, and that they live in really one of the best cities in America um, that has a great school system uh, that really invests in its infrastructure and uh, is really committed to making sure that we have a high quality of life uh, for the for the families as well as the businesses. We're also really special because we have local um, businesses. You know, we have locally owned bookstores, which you don't find in a lot of communities anymore. We have several locally owned bookstores. Um, we have a lot of locally owned businesses. We care about investing in our local businesses. So I think those would be the things that I would brag about. Um, and then I would also ask them to follow me on Twitter and Facebook so they could see what's going on in the city as well. Well, I agree with uh, with David. This is a unique city. Uh, that's what I would tell people. That's why they came here. <laughs> uh, I see this all the time. I do have a bookstore downtown, Gabriel Books on Market Street. And I get people in all the time asking me uh, about Northampton. Uh, it's, bookstores are always kind of a first stop for people when they come to town. They figure that you're going to know everything that's going on in town. Um, and they want to know where to go, what to do, uh, all those kind of things. Uh, I would also let them know uh, that I've been involved in the city for over 40 years uh, in building the city. Uh, my wife and I co-founded the Iron Horse with a partner over 40 years ago when the town was full of vacant stores, many more than there are now. 
we went on to found uh, the Globe Bookshop. Uh, my wife ran a store, Karina Karina, which uh, dressed maternity mothers for years and gave them learning toys. Um, we worked to bring the Montessori School downtown and bring it under cooperative ownership, and now we own Gabriel Books. I would let them know that this is a town of opportunity. If you have imagination, if you have something that you want to do, this is the town to do it in. This is a town that has a receptive audience. This is a town that wants you to succeed. That's the feeling my wife and I had when we came here. It's a feeling that we still have, that you can do anything here. If you have a great idea, a unique idea, do it. Do it in Northampton. Thank you both. All right, next question will come from Stan. And John, you can answer it first. Uh, the mayor just mentioned that one of the attributes of Northampton is its great school system, yet there is money departing from Northampton, going to charter schools, schools of choice, and so forth. How, uh, what's your position on exp expanded charter schools? Uh, would you be aggressive as mayor in attempting to stop expansion of current charter schools? And what, uh, what priority do you see as a need in the Northampton schools to keep more families in the public schools? I'm actually very torn on that issue, but I would stand with uh, our city council and with those who would tell uh, charter schools that they can't expand until there is full funding to public schools for, for students that leave. I think charter schools have proven how inventive they can be. Uh, my daughter went to Pioneer Valley Performing Arts High School. It was perfectly made for her. She's an artist and went there the second year that it was, was founded. Uh, Pioneer Valley uh, Chinese uh, Immersion Charter School is unique uh, in the country. Uh, I don't know if there are any schools like that anywhere else. These do provide challenges to our schools. I would really work to cooperate more with the charter schools. It would be a battle to uh, have unions uh, maybe do more unionizing in those schools uh, to get the state to fund uh, charter schools uh, to, to fund public schools uh, on a more level way but we have to cooperate uh, people are going to the charter schools for a reason people send their kids to the Chinese charter school because they see it as a future for their kids kids that graduate from their have an international baccalaureate, they can go to Harvard as sophomores when they graduate. If you didn't have a lot of money and you wanted a future for your kid, that would be very, very attractive. I think we have to have our public schools work more closely with the charter schools and learn from each other, but the funding has to be there. So if you read any one of my budget messages for the last six years, charter school funding um, is, and, and frankly, the choice funding and the foundation budget funding have been central parts of that. It's really, um, it, it's, uh, it's fundamentally putting a drain on our schools. It's unfair. The funding formula itself, um, you know, the, the, the legislature uh, sets tuitions for these schools. Um, they don't fully reimburse uh, the, the cities and towns uh, based on the law because the law says subject to appropriation and they conveniently never appropriate the money. Um, the issue that I have with the charters, though, is that really it, they're, they're not only is the funding formula different, but they're playing by a different set of rules. I mean, that's the problem fundamentally with why I oppose the expansion of the Chinese Immersion Charter School. Um, you know, the, the record shows that they have a disproportionately smaller number of um, disadvantaged and special needs kids. They're, they're basically, um, you know, uh, self-selecting a group of students. And that's not a public school to me. If you want a private school th that you can self-select, go to a private school. But we shouldn't have schools that are using public dollars that are basically excluding pretty systematically um, high, high needs and disadvantaged students. Um, that's just not right and it's not fair and public schools um, are the ultimate form of democracy where the doors are open. We educate everyone and I'm really proud of our school system in Northampton because we've committed ourselves to educating every child. So we've got to change the charter uh, structure uh, we, and we should not allow any more to expand. Okay, thank you. Um, Jean, I think we have time for one more question from the audience and then we'll move on to our closing statements. 
Okay, please describe your experience in government. Where have you served and in what capacity? Let's go to you first, David. So, um, I uh, graduated from the University of Massachusetts with a degree in political science uh, after I served in the United States Air Force. Um, I worked on Capitol Hill for several years as a legislative aide in Washington, D.C. to uh, four U.S. congressmen working on policy issues. I then came back to uh, Western Massachusetts um, and worked for Congressman John Olver, who many of you know represented Western Mass for several years, working on um, economic development issues, um, and, um, and then got involved in local government. I actually stepped out of the workforce and was a stay-at-home dad and got really involved here in Northampton city government. Uh, Mayor Ford appointed me to the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, which really gave me an education about land use and sort of a close-in view of how uh, neighborhood issues happen. Um, I then was appointed to the Transportation and Parking Commission, uh, which is a relatively new body. I served as the chair uh, for many years and helped develop many of the policies that we have. Um, then I ran for Ward 4 City Council and represented Ward 4 two terms on the City Council. Um, my friend Jim Jim Dostal retired from at-large and asked me to run in his place. I ran, got elected at-large, uh, was elected president of the city council, um, and then I was had the great honor to be elected mayor in 2011 and then re-elected uh, again in 2013. So that's my experience. I think I have a really uh, clear record. You can go to my website and look at my record and the accomplishments that I've put together. Um, and I think it's really important to have some experience in government if you're going to be the chief executive officer. I might say that my experience with government has been on the receiving end, uh, having been the head of the committee to repeal the stormwater fee. I ran into stonewalling. I ran into deafness uh, when I dealt with the government. I did not get customer service, as you would expect, from a, a good company. I appeared in front of the city council. I wrote to the city council. I pushed as hard as I could to get them to listen to what I think are a majority of people in Northampton that opposed that. They had hearings, hundreds of people showed up opposing it, and they still passed it. I was on the receiving end of the government as far as that was concerned. When we tried to get the repeal on the ballot, we were rejected by the city solicitor who serves at the favor of the current mayor told us that we couldn't put on the ballot, that we only had three weeks to question a ballot, uh, an ordinance. I searched the Constitution to see if there was something in there that prevented people from opposing a law after three weeks. I couldn't find one. It was an arbitrary decision to deny us the vote, to deny us the ballot. We didn't receive our bills until almost a year after that ordinance was passed. The head of the DPW did not present where that money was going until two years later, yet we could not get it on the ballot. So I was on the receiving end of the government. Thank you. That concludes our panelist questions. Um, we're now going to give each candidate, candidate two minutes to provide their closing statements. Um, and, and then we will be segueing into the next portion of our, of our forum for the city clerks. So. Um, so the closing statements, John, you'll go first, and then David. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much again for having this forum. I think it is, is a unique situation. It's a chance for all of us in the city to come together and decide where we want to go, what direction we want to go. It's not just a choice of candidates. It really is a decision of the city what direction we want to go. Do we want a city that listens to its, its public, that listens to its citizens? We do, and I would do that. I, I would be a listener. Uh, I want to acknowledge some people who have helped me. Uh, my campaign manager, Tony Patillo, my wife, Patty, my daughter, Karina. They would be ambassadors for me to the education community, to the health community. I would really look forward to having them working side, side by side with me. I think we have a clear distinction between someone who has a vision of, of where the city can go and a very competent manager. 
I think the city needs a vision now to where we want to go in the future. And I think we have to have all portions of the city involved, all wards. I think that we need to build on our history. This is a key part of my platform, is to build on our history to draw more people to the city. I do have a business downtown. I haven't been in government. I have been a business person. I have built the city from the ground up. And I know what the city needs. I know it needs more foot traffic for the downtown. I know it needs more uh, international and, and tourism to, to keep the city floating. I know that we need more industry. I would hope that we could draw more international businesses working off of uh, the, the international stature that we already have. But I would have an administration that listens, that works based on what we all want. So I want to thank the sponsors of this forum, everyone who attended, and of course John Riley for engaging in the issues with me. It's been my incredible honor and privilege to lead our city as mayor of Northampton, and I'm proud of my record and what we've accomplished together. I'm running for re-election because I want to build on those successes while meeting the new challenges and opportunities that face us as a community. I want to continue managing our tax dollars wisely and create stable budgets and invest in our priorities and our values. I want to continue working to support and invest in excellent public schools. I want to continue supporting our local economy and businesses, including our cultural economy, and making strategic public investments in housing and economic development. I want to continue investing in great green spaces like our amazing new Pulaski Park, Florence Fields, the Connecticut River Greenway Park. I want to continue Northampton's leadership role in sustainability, renewable energy, protecting open space and agricultural land, and addressing climate change. I want to continue ensuring that our city government is open, transparent, and inclusive. I want to continue to keep our city affordable for working families and retirees, rebuild our streets and sidewalks, serve our veterans and seniors, expand passenger rail, and continue to lead on the opioid crisis facing our city and region. Finally, I want to keep Northampton a diverse and welcoming community that remains committed to protecting the rights of everyone to live, to love, to work, to learn, to run a business, and to raise a family. We live in an amazing city, and it's been my honor to go to work for you every day as your mayor. I ask for your support and your vote on November 7th so that together we can keep moving our great city forward. Thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful to you both for your public service, your dedication to the city, and, um, and for this, answering all these rigorous questions. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to ask our candidates for city clerk to come forward. Okay. We will set you up.